Welcome to another roundtable session. The topic for today is artificial intelligence and machine learning in cardiothoracic surgery. My name is Armand Klitsch from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and I'll serve as the moderator for this discussion. Why don't we start off by going around the table and introducing ourselves? Great, I'm Arav Aporjan from Houston, Texas, general thoracic surgeon. I'm Brian Ayers from the University of Rochester, uh, fourth year medical student. Okay, so Brian, why don't we start with you? Why don't we start out with some basic definitions first? People hear the terms artificial intelligence and machine learning all the time. Can you give us some basic definitions of what those mean and how they're different? Yeah, yeah. So artificial intelligence is the kind of broad umbrella term for adding more cognitive ability to the machines. Um, and machine learning is a subset of that, which uh, really focuses on these algorithms that are able to learn from the data uh, in ways that traditional statistics aren't able to account for. Okay. And why don't we start off uh, the discussion also by looking at predictive analytics in cardiothoracic surgery. So I think this is going to be a major implication of how AI and machine learning will fit into CT surgery. So Aura, can you tell us a little bit about how you see AI and ML working, let's say, with the STS database or in our day-to-day -day in terms of risk prediction? So there's a whole number of ways that it could be embedded into the database. The most obvious one is risk modeling, something we've been trying to do. Obviously, everybody wants to do it, sort of the holy grail of database research. Um, we're limited in some of these things by guessing what the predictive factors will be and then analyzing for them statistically. Whereas the hope would be with machine learning, it would uncover relationships that we didn't even anticipate and improve the predictive ability on the data set. That's a promise. Don't know if we can deliver that, but that certainly is a promise of machine learning. There are other areas, obviously, that I could think of from a cancer perspective, reading CT scans, obviously already being looked at for reading mammograms, predicting operative results, deciding you know, which treatment algorithm to use. Should we go with an induction therapy? Should we not go with an induction therapy? So the whole host of support with machine learning in clinical decision making, but I think with a database, the big sort of low-hanging fruit that everybody wants to reach up and grab is risk adjustment. Now, one of the issues that's often brought up with machine learning is the, that they're black box, so that, you know, these algorithms, we don't, we have limited insight into how they're making their predictions. So in that conversation of how we may incorporate this into the STS database and use it for risk prediction, how do we sort of tackle that? You know, there's, there's the concern that there may be some kind of bias that's introduced. For instance, let's say race, gender, HIV status. You know, the models may be using those to bias against therapy for certain groups, but we don't know that because it's a black box. So how do, how do we tackle that problem? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And, and, and the, the black box aspect of machine learning, they're not true black boxes. We know what's happening in there. We know every weight. We know exactly how they're learning. It's just low interpretability. And so we can't say for a given prediction exactly how the model arrived at that prediction. Um, so as you said, that it creates a, an environment that's very susceptible to outliers and uh, making predictions with unintended consequences. You know, the, we, we're not sure if the model's picking up on some un, uh, underlying bias in the data that we don't know about. You know, what if it's predicting based on gender alone? Um, so I think it's really important for these low interpretability models to have really robust te um, testing. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to make sure that it's a very robust model and we understand if there's any underlying biases in the data before we go applying these models um, to ensure that it doesn't pick up on a, on a, on a pattern that we don't want. Mm -hmm. And what imaging, Ara, you had brought up imaging and the role, and I, I see that as a big, you know, big implication of AI and ML, not just on thoracic, on the cardiac side as well. You know, there's studies looking at EKGs, for instance, and the ML models are performing with comparable, if not better, performance than board certified I mean, cardiologists. The gender of the patient. Gender of the yeah, patient. Know, yeah, remarkable insane. things. Yeah. So the question for that is, you know, the first thing people say are, are radiologists going to be out of business, yeah. right? Because you have these machine learning algorithms that can read 500 images in a minute, and they do it as well as board certified radiologists. So, how do we tackle that issue? How do we incorporate it? Is it going to be a replacement or is it going to be assistive? Yeah, those are issues beyond just the technical aspect. These sort of get into the social and the healthcare policy issues. I, I don't know. I mean, we used to have leech farmers, right, who produced <laughs> leeches uh, for clinical care. Um, we didn't so much worry about what happened to the leech farmers anymore as we move beyond that. I'm not saying in any way, shape, or form that our radiology colleagues are farmers of leeches, but the concept is we're going to learn, test, 
and probably there will be a different role for a radiologist. I'm sure that this machine learning will not end with a final diagnostic, but it will be rather a supportive thing, right? Mm -hmm. And then the radiologist will have to step in and apply their expert ability to this. But it would be nice if you could screen away the easy cases for a radiologist and let them focus their expertise on the more complex cases. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's going to require a standard and a bar that's going to have to be hit uh, that's at least as good, if not better, than what is currently there. Mm -hmm. uh, but it may also allow you to expend and provide these resources for underserved areas, right? I mean, you could see many areas where screening just doesn't exist. And yet, using this sort of a machine learning, we could now leverage one individual to cover 10 screening programs instead of training one for each program and putting them out there. Um, similar to any other sort of expansion of healthcare, like the critical care people have done with ICUs where one critical care doctor can monitor multiple beds in different hospitals. A similar sort of leveraging of the technology to improve healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, so I see it that way. I see the radiologist role changing, but not going away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think augmented intelligence is a great term. Um, you know, I don't think these are going to be autonomous decision-making tools that are going to take over for doctors and make the ultimate decision. But I think it's going to be augmented intelligent models that are able to bring in more data than we're currently able to comprehend and bring in trends nationwide in real time um, and do time series data analysis predicting real-time events for patients. Um, and it's going to be another data point for the team. And it's not going to be the end-all decision maker, but it's going to be another piece of data that can inform and hopefully improve patient outcomes. Another aspect that I think is worthy of discussion is how AI and ML will fit into the operating room. I was just thinking And, that. and um, you know, both from a training perspective, mm -hmm. so can we use AI to train the next generation, but also in terms of assisting us with surgery, whether it's imaging um, or in performing surgical tasks. So can, we, can you guys speak a little bit about that and what your thoughts are on that? So I see roles for that already being developed. Um, if you can leverage the video input from a million right upper lobectomies, mm -hmm. you're going to be able to identify when a particularly risky maneuver is being done. One of the big advantages touted by robotic cars is the idea that when I'm in my car and I change lanes and I forget to look back because of a certain curve in the road, and I have a near miss with a car, I've now learned to look for that pattern on the road mm -hmm. and try and minimize that near miss. When a robotic car has a near miss like that, every other robotic car on the road now knows that information. Mm -hmm. So we can disseminate that, that near miss instantly to all the other cars. So imagine a robot is videotaping and learning from every single right upper lobectomy ever performed across the entire planet and would know when a PA ruptures because too much pressure is being placed, too much torque is being put on the vessel. Imagine an augmented situation where a warning flashes mm -hmm. on the screen and says, you may be approaching this with too much pressure on this vessel. And that would be a form of augmented reality and machine learning that is brought into the operating room as a supportive device for the surgeon, right? Mm -hmm. um, that would be one example. I, I could see for training other examples, but... Uh, yeah. yeah, imagine, uh, you know, and established surgeons may be annoyed if they have little pop-up warnings going on, but what if you could put it in training mode? And so when you pass the robot control over to a trainee, they have the warning lights going off, and maybe if the, you know, the machine learning algorithm thinks they're about to bovie right through the recurrent laryngeal, it stops it. Mm -hmm. and it requires the attending to override it if they think it's okay. Mm -hmm. But just another safety mechanism to actually give trainees more autonomy because the attending can feel safer that it's a machine learning algorithm also watching over them. Mm -hmm. And similar things exist in planes right yeah. now. Right? You're not allowed to make certain moves on an airplane, right? right? It questions the wisdom of that certain move and puts up a warning. Right, yeah. and I think there's other aspects in the operating room beyond the actual surgical procedure. If you think about anesthesia, mm -hmm. how they're running things in the operating room or for, or for on the cardiac side, how perfusion's running the cardiopulmonary bypass machine. I think there's a lot of implications for how AI and ML may mm -hmm. be incorporated into that. Let's move on to talk a little bit about some of the issues with bringing AI and ML into real world practice. So as you guys are aware, the FDA is considering treating AI and ML essentially as a medical device. 
Um, so do you think this is going to be a roadblock? Is this going to slow down the field in terms of incorporating some of these technologies into CT surgery? Um, I think it's an appropriate safety measure to take. I think that these are new technologies and there may be an overestimate of their ability um, based on a desire to have them work well mm -hmm. and unless they're tested clearly and aggressively uh, and beta tested to make sure that they're safe, I worry that people may rely on it too heavily. Similar to the cars, I mean we were talking earlier about the Tesla and their ability to drive autonomously on a road, but people have taken that capability and pushed it to an extreme such that there have been deaths in Tesla's doing that. So even though Tesla was very clear about the limitations of their technology, people overestimated that technology and relied on it too heavily and got into trouble. And, and that is something that I would worry about in, in the sort of bringing it into the sphere of a clinician. Yeah, I think, I think as a society it's going to um, take a uh, agreement about what level of accuracy we, we require from these algorithms. You know, is it 100% accurate? It's, we can't achieve that. Um, and so I think as a society we have to decide what level, what number of deaths caused by an artificial intelligence algorithm would be acceptable. Um, you know, it, it, the, the goal is to reach 100%, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, so I think that's why the initial step should be just augmenting um, clinicians um, and have clinicians are still the final say um, to be able to get some of the benefits of this really innovative technology um, without having to say um, any fallbacks and pitfalls from causing a death, for example, if it's implemented too quickly. Well, as we were discussing earlier, I think you, you think about media implications for if there is a mistake yeah. leading to death and, and what we think about are the self-driving cars when they run over a pedestrian or somebody riding their bike. And, you know, so I do think we're going to have to have pretty stringent measures for, for how we're going to define that threshold of accuracy, but it'll certainly be up for debate. And we're going to have to manage the public's expectations of these developments, right? Like, think of Proton, uh, yeah, right. right? It's new, it's novel, therefore must be better. We, we need to manage that expectation, right? right. It, it's better, but only in a certain degree, like you said. Yeah. And that's why I think, too, if it's assistive or augmented, and the physicians and clinicians are still in ultimate control of what's being done with the patient, that may be a better way to navigate how we incorporate some of these technologies. Yeah. Okay, well, any other comments? Guys? It's exciting. It's Very going to exciting. change. Yeah. And I think in, within the, sh the field of machine learning, there's a lot going on in terms of moving away from just worrying about the accuracy of a given model towards the overall robustness and how it can be implemented. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's a lot of work being done to try to eliminate the black box a aspect and increase the interpretability of these models, which I think will help immensely for a field like uh, for healthcare. Yeah, and there's certainly algorithms that, that are not, as you mentioned, are not black boxes. You can see the relative importance of each variable with the granularity that you would see with, for instance, logistic regression. So I think potentially incorporating some of those ML models are going to be the way to go because, you know, clinicians want insight into what are the risk factors and how do we potentially modify those risk factors or how do we do better. Yeah, for sure. Okay, well, thank you for joining uh, this roundtable. This concludes our session on artificial intelligence and machine learning in cardiothoracic surgery.